Welcome back to class, everybody. Construction management here, class. And uh, today we're going to be mostly in PowerPoint, this lecture. Spending some time on the lecture being called the uh, basic components. So we're going to go back a little bit, spend a little more time in detail looking at components. Uh, last lecture we looked at some of them, but need to go back a little bit more and go through them in more detail. So let's uh, let's jump right in. Start with switching. Now there's all kinds of switches and stuff, but I think it's worthwhile to to look at uh, these in more detail. Now look at the the language in the in the PowerPoint here. Switches control loads by opening and closing circuits. So we're we're saying the control loads, meaning whether the electricity is flowing through the wire and opening and closing circuits so the opening and closing is language circuits is language that you need to be able to speak in in the electrical and then this is a good intro to electrical devices and how much uh, stuff is actually written on the electrical device so take a look at uh, this this, this uh, slides showing all the information you can actually see on the actual device itself and I don't know if uh, seems like electrical is sort of unique that way with how much stuff is actually on the on the device and you take like a plumbing drain or um, say a faucet or maybe maybe mechanical uh, equipment as well could be like this where it has a lot of uh, information on it but check it out. We got copper, uh, copper clad wires only written here. Maximum amperage 15 amps. Maximum voltage 120 volts. AC only, right? So we're talking AC versus DC, but not the band. And then we got the underwriter laboratory listing here. And then got some elongated holes for the box. So this is where the screw is going to come into the junction box to hold this in. And this can be the the switch can be adjusted a little bit so that's straight up and down and then we have these plaster ears so these help keep this on the face of the drywall or the face of the plaster or whatever you want to call it depending on what the the finish is we got the ground terminal in that is the strip gauge as well showing how far to remove the insulation on the on the wire um, and we've got the what line we're going to be interrupting. So we got the the hot wire that we're going to interrupt right here getting pushed in. So let's move on. Let's keep going. Looking at the back of a different type of switch here. And it still shows like the in that last one it was the switch where it, uh, let's see go back. It has just like two terminals on it right and then a ground but it also has these holes where you could push in a wire so it could be done either way this one is a is an outlet not a switch it looks like to me even the but it says that it's the back of a switch on my slide here but uh, again just a different view of it different kinds all different kinds of switches from single pole, three way, four way switches, um, double pole. Now, I, I, I still don't have four way switching figured out exactly in my head how that works. Uh, I know how three way switching works real well. Four way, double pole, what that's all for, I don't know. The, uh, we got some, the idea of a duplex here duplex switch or do and then you have a switch plus a an outlet here all kinds of different switches here you got a motion sensor or a timer um, anyway all different kinds of switches a lock or a keyed switch all kinds of good stuff here just to know that there's lots of different kinds I think it's pretty obvious we went over this last time but I didn't spend a lot of time with the last, uh, the last lecture I went through had this all in EMT, and uh, meaning uh, electrical metallic tubing. But uh, 
we also have this um, armored or non-metallic and they're showing the wiring here and how it could be done and so this uh, you have the source and, and look at the the black wire it's not immediately going to the light fixture it's going through so in this case say the uh, the power source was over here in the in the room coming from this side and uh, they want to put the the light switch farther away from the power source say over here so the idea here is you could run um, some armored cable meaning like MC or BX uh, cable we'll go through that in a little bit or Romex and you could bring that through and notice that this is just one uh, set of sheathed wire so what it would be like a um, wire with two two uh, insulated wires and then a bare copper and so they can use on you can use any of the one of the options is this is this format here where you're running uh, the source through and come all the way back and then use one of the legs uh, in this case they call it a switch leg but it would be the white wire to come back and tie back in now the other option is to move this switch over to this side and then interrupt the uh, interrupt the power source on its way to the light but in this case they have the power source going through the light uh, junction box and then coming with one um, with one armored or non-metallic cable and and using the neutral wire uh, to come back and connect back to the hot side of the light fixture and then you can see here the neutral wire coming back right they're not showing the ground on this one but uh, it's an option here to be able to do it that way and we went through three-way switching last time which was uh, but but let's just go through it again okay so we have the the power coming in to this junction box here for the light and so on this side the the power the hot is coming over here and landing on that terminal right here for this three-way switch and then it it has two two conductors to be able to carry it back or joining the this switch with two conductors with that switch with two conductors on this three-way switch and so what what uh, what wire would this be in this case if we were doing with um, like Romex it would be one two three plus a ground okay normally your Romex is just if you're not if you're not on a on a three-way switch you're just one two in a ground and this one you're three plus a ground but notice that the power is coming in and then depending on which which terminal this switch is on uh, determines whether the power can get all the way actually uh, this switch switches the power between these two terminals it's either going to this, the power is coming to this one I can't tell in the junction box which which side this is coming to but let's say this outer one and is this switch connecting to this terminal let's say it is then the power comes through and back to the light now if the light so let's follow that along power through here the switch is on this terminal goes all the way through to this and the switch is on this terminal when it switches it's saying this one's the one that's on so it allows power to go through and over to the light now if this switch was on the other terminal say this one power comes in power comes over here hits this terminal that it's not shown very well uh, but there's another there's another little uh, screw to be able to hold down uh, hold down that wire and this switch it's on this one so the power comes over to here and stops not until they switch that up or change change the the position of the switch does it move it over to this side and allows power to come through hopefully 
follow on that a little bit here with this diagram. Uh, we had this in the last lecture, but I think it's worthwhile talking three-way switches a little bit, especially since that's like the most I know how to, to do with, uh, I don't know how to do four, four-way switches. So the, uh, I think super obvious here on what an outlet looks like, everybody should know, but, uh, and the idea is, boy, I, I don't know. I mean, this is super obvious. You should be able to plug in a flexible cord, right? Um, some sort of portable electrical equipment. And so let's just run through what, what we have on this, uh, outlet here. We had the break off tabs, if they need to need to be there or not. And uh, in plaster or drywall, these are worthwhile so that they can uh, put that right onto the face of the drywall so this sticks out uh, or plaster. Long slots indicate common or polarized receptacle. And then we've got the uh, still colored screw indicating the common side. And then you have the underwriter's lab label, copper wire or aluminum wire is what this little note says. So you can use aluminum or copper in this in this outlet. You got the grounding hole, the Canadian standards on it, the breakaway tab uh, for the so that you could separate the um, whether this is right now they're joined. If you broke that out, this outlet could be different than this. So sometimes you see like um, outlets in a living room or something like that being uh, controlled, and so. Normally, you take like the bottom part of that outlet and separate it with this breakaway tab. And then this can be wired separately to this. So you could put the wire from a switch over to this terminal. And then this is only hot when the switch is uh, closing the circuit. And so this would be plugged into like a lamp or something in the living room while this is the power for uh, that part right there. Anyway, uh, you can do that. Bronze colored screw indicates hot side of the receptacle. Green colored screw indicates the ground. And the smaller slot indicates the polarized receptacle. Hopefully you read through, understood all that. Obviously there's lots of different kinds of uh, receptacles or outlets. And uh, so there is, there is a lot like uh, this is the standard receptacle for 15 amp 120 volts and you can see all different kinds here I'm cruising all the way up to this uh, 120 40 volt and a 50 amp um, for like an electric range or something like that um, so lots of different options for outlets one comment for during construction on a residential home there isn't very there, if, if you have temp power going um, to some temporary panel and you don't have your panel live yet, that there has been instances that in my career where we've needed a 220 outlet for some, like a tile saw or um, a floor grinder or uh, like a floor sander for, for um, a wood floor. So... It's something to plan out for sure and discuss with the trades that are going to work with uh, work with you on the home to find out their power needs and especially coordinating. Sometimes they'll bring their own, like it's uh, pretty common for a sub to bring their own outlet, but then they'll need a 240 volt uh, source of power. And so sometimes switching out like... Um, I know in one instance we didn't have a 240 volt outlet anywhere because every all the uh, the range was gas, the dryer was gas, and so we didn't have one. We had to wire one up out of the panel for uh, the trade so they could run uh, what they needed. But know that it's uh, both coordinating the end result plus the coordination during construction. It's a worthwhile discussion. All right, let's go to this. The switches and the receptacles must be covered according to the, uh, the, I don't know that I've even said, National Electric Code, NEC. And so we've got different face plates here, switch uh, and receptacle covers. You've got uh, all kinds of things here that are 
um, weatherproof on this side or or rated for weather right all right let's get into the non-metallic and in the last lecture I called it Romex and that's just a popular brand of non-metallic uh, non-metallic sheathing or, or uh, um, missing a word here anyway the sheathing is is non-metallic and the uh, this is mostly a plastic jacket and then some paper and then you have individual conductors that are um, that have their own insulation the, the conductors are insulated and then in this case the the ground is bare and it's not insulated but normally it's like got a paper covering or something on it and so reading this right here we have a 12 gauge wire and it's three with ground so let's just look at it we have a white a black and a red that's the three and with ground so that's that's right there we have the ground wire so 12 gauge three three wires with the ground um three i should say three insulated uh wires or conductors and then on this one we've got 14 two so what's that 14 gauge and there's two conductors that are insulated with a ground here so checking that out We've got a black wire and a white wire, these two conductors, and then we've got the ground conductor that's just the paper covering. All right, we're reading through a little bit of just a non metallic sheath, commonly referred to as Romex. Now, we have boxes found in residential, and I've seen a lot of uh, plastic and not a lot of metal. Um, so I think that if, if my understanding of the code is, is correct, uh, the idea is that you can have plastic if it's covered up with uh, drywall, but in a room where like a mechanical room or something that doesn't have drywall and you had an outlet, my understanding is you'd have to have a metal box, but I could be wrong. Uh, my, uh, my electrical code knowledge is not, not super good. But uh, check out, it doesn't matter whether it's a, uh, so we have a square box. Why would we want that? Because we want two, uh, two devices in there, meaning we want two outlets or two switches. Uh, that's why we'd want this bigger junction box or receptacle box. Here we have a single receptacle box for a single switch or a single receptacle. And then here, this is more for the ceiling light, this, this octagon shape. And on the metallic ones, on the metal uh, junction boxes, they have these knockouts where that's where the uh, the raceway is going to come in or the, the conduit or the, uh, in any case, it could be the uh, non-metallic as well. Just need to have a way to join it. You might be asking yourself, well, how do they join that to the wall? And on this slide, we've got a couple different options. So we've got, let me uh, throw the magnifying glass on here. And you could have nails or a strap and you can kind of see the, uh, that front strap or the side straps. Um, there's a side strap. You could have this guy right here, which is uh, mounted between two joists and then some sort of bar hanger also seen the bar hanger in in studs like that but most folks don't go to the trouble on a residential to do that on uh, unless you're really trying to get this outlet to line up with something maybe like in a kitchen or something um, or maybe an office space where we or even a bedroom I guess if, if the layout really matters uh, where they where these go so they can line up with uh, with something you'll see 
some sort of hanger or bar hanger or backing or but a lot of times in like just a normal um, just your standard home without a lot of detail on it they're just in like this or go into the the, the uh, plastic and you can see like this this would be uh, nailed into the stud also you see here we have the the knockout where the where your circuit wiring is going to come in and in this case this is non-metallic that would be coming in here so it'd be Romex or something like that and now all non-metallic cables they need to be secured and have to be secured at least eight inches um, from the box uh, I think no more than eight inches away from the box and so the I should say that differently I think that you have to have eight inches I'm not positive again I'm not super great at this so I think on a I think you have to have eight inches of wire below the box or at the top of the box or something like that anyway there's lots of different ways to do that usually you see something like this where you have a staple and a little non-metallic uh, way of of, of uh, making sure that you have this plastic sheathing not not damaged by the staple something like that We'd covered this last time, but uh, cable nor or cable conductors, wiring, however we want to say it, routed through the center of the studs or the floor joists, and uh, so typically the holes are drilled, or uh, like the holes in the studs are drilled by the electrician. I think that may be hopefully obvious to say, but no one's no one's a uh, drilling those holes out for them and the floor joists if they're two by material they're they're drilled out by the electrician but on like TJI framing there's a uh, little knockouts in the in the joist webbing where you can uh, just take your hammer and knock that out and it'll create a little uh, hole in the joist just perfect for you and you can run uh, the cabling or the race or the raceway or whatever it might be through there And when you're drilling through through the the studs like this, you don't have to like put any more additional supports in by code. Um, and then one one other thing that needs to be known is there's a I think that if it's I have to go look at the code again, but I thought that in a two by four you could be in the center two by six you can definitely be in the center but I'm pretty sure if you're within a like not centered you have to cover these plates or if they notch this right here uh, you have to put a plat a metal plate over it so sometimes that happens when you have like plumbing going through uh, a similar space and they have to like hug one side of the wall or something uh, then they'll put some uh, metal plates right right over the top of this so that it uh, protects it from the drywall screws and so this is lots of different ways to to run this uh, wiring as well in a corner uh, electrician could try and get it through the corner on on this uh, drilling from each side uh, notching is one way to do this and going up and around or down below is all options to get through corners now dealing with masonry it's not super common in utah to have a, a masonry like this um, but you can run non-metallic or um, another like the same word i'm trying to use the same word as great uh, the common term is uh, romex you can run that in in the masonry if it's a uh, moisture isn't there and uh, so you can treat that like 
uh, you can use that. Anyway, if we had a concrete block in Utah, we don't see a lot of this. Other parts of the country, it's pretty uncommon to have like a foundation made of concrete. Um, so it just depends on which part of the nation you're in, really. Regional. Now I talked a little bit about um, securing the cable to the outlet. And so there's there's lots of different ways. So right here we have these non-metallic cable clamps. So this is a metal box, but you're doing non-metallic to it, like Romex. You have to be able to join this, uh, that, that circuit into this box with something that is non-metal. And so they have these, these different clamps to be able to do that with. Switching to from non-metallic to uh, a metal jacket. So often referred to as BX or MC. And I think that the biggest difference between MC and BX is whether this metal jacket can be used as, um, I don't know, is the bonding, is that right? Anyway, there's something to do with, uh, again, it's not, it's, I don't really even care from my perspective what the electrician does, uh, as long as he passes the inspection at the end of the day and he's following the specifications, but MC and, and uh, BX are similar and that you'll see this like spiral wound metal jacket and then you have the insulation on the wires usually some paper wrapping them as well and then you see the actual conductor right here and this will come in the same thing to be like this would be uh, anyway you have the bonding strip as well but it's armored cable in this case There's a, a picture of how to end the end of the armored cable. So you have to, again, do like a little bushing inside of there so that it has a, you can't have this metal be, it's pretty sharp. And so you can't just cut it off and not have something there to be able to make that end transition. And then we have to we have to support the uh, the MC cable or the BX cable. But basically, I'm going to say armored cables from now on, and uh, different connectors, right? So you have different cable clamps that you could use. Uh, lots of different options here, and all I'm trying to show you is give you an intro to hey, there's lots of different ways to do this, and I don't know that one is right or better than the other. I'm sure there is means and methods to it. The specifications might govern on a large commercial project or something where like uh, the type of building on a campus might matter. But usually on a light commercial project, it's going to be a, or even a residential project, it's going to be up to the electrician to figure out exactly what he wants to use. Now, government jobs with uh, like UFGS specifications like govern a whole bunch of this kind of stuff. So it just depends on who the client is and how, how, how detailed their specifications are as whether what can be used and what's not. Okay, so the bonding wire on armored cable, um, it would then be, you can use, like I said, this would be a BX, I think, an environment where uh, you have this little connector going over the top and the bonding wire slips in there. Um, Anyway, just something to know, not a big deal. Now the other conduit we talked about was EMT, electrical metallic tubing, rigid and flex. So the EMT is super common uh, in, I'm not really seeing it a lot in residential uh, except on um, the outside sometimes actually I haven't seen much EMT on anything but uh, more expensive uh, commercial projects and so but rigid 
is uh, notice that there's no like threads on EMT. So the coupler, this is going to be joined by coupler or something like that, or uh, um, a way to join into a junction box. But the rigid, it's it's a uh, usually thicker metal, and it's got uh, threads on it. And then you have the flexible conduit. This is called convolution. Not even sure why. But uh, the flex is, is really common as well. And that's, that's pretty common to go from, say, uh, rigid to flex or EMT to flex to be able to go make the, the transition to like a piece of equipment or something like that that's vibrating, uh, like a pump or uh, something that's going to move a lot. And so they'll, they'll make that transition from one of these to this. Um, pretty common. This can also be used outside. Uh, if it has like this um, sheath over the top of it. So now this is this is something dealt with uh, a lot in on the federal jobs that I worked on where they had uh, specific inspectors in the conduit fill. So by by uh, specification, it was more more uh, specific or more restricting than the than the code on how much you could fill how many conductors you could put inside the the raceway so in this case we're talking like emt or rigid or that flex that they're pulling individual wires through and so the individually um insulated right so it wouldn't be um, they wouldn't pull Romex through an EMT uh, metal. So uh, the, the EMT conduit, you wouldn't pull Romex through. It would be individually insulated wires usually that you see. But the, the conduit fill is, so they run a certain amount of conduits, and then you can bring more than one, one circuit through there, and the but you can only do it to a certain amount of filling and then on some of the projects that i was on it was even restricted beyond what the code was or how full you could make uh, a raceway or, or a conduit so anyway just know that's a deal and then conduit is usually done it's bent it's usually coming in like 10 foot lengths, EMT is. And uh, they bend it on site usually. And, or you can buy pre-bent pieces as well, usually in like rigid or called sweeps. Or uh, it could be a 45 as well. But most of the time, the EMT is just bent on site. And it's pretty fun to see the electrician and their skill to be able to bend up EMT and really make their 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 craft their uh, their work. It's uh, pretty good to pretty good to see that. Uh, I think it's an amazing skill. And so all they do is is this little uh, there's there's little degrees on these this uh, this bender here, and they hook the the conduit while it's laying down really in this mode right here. It'd be hooked, and then you pull that. Uh, pull the bender over and you see like oh now it moved to like 90 degrees or pulled it up to that spot where this is straight up and down that's 45 right um, not not that I ever really got into that mode I just trying to share what you might experience on a project where they're gonna bring out a whole stack of uh, EMT and Know that there's a bunch of time for them to bend it all up, put it in place, join it together, pull a wire. And so from a from a construction standpoint, from my perspective, uh, it's just a bit of scheduling and, and how long the duration might be. And knowing that uh, it's once the conduit's in, doesn't mean they're necessarily done. Um, wherein if they ran Romex, once you run Romex or MC or BX, armored cable, once you run that that uh, 
that wiring over there, the cable over, it there's not any more additional steps to it other than to cover it and then finish it after the inspection and stuff. But uh, on on this one where you're doing EMT, the it's multiple steps. It's running the running, getting the conduit in there, bending it all up, securing it, and then pulling wire through. terminating and landing the wire <clears throat> okay and I said that the, the EMT has some uh, connectors couplers all kinds of different ways to do it um, you see some more options here couplers that we are uh, connectors and couplers to join two links of conduit together but it is work and like I said, it looks really nice. I think it's a, I think from an industrial standpoint, some of my favorite things on uh, the industrial side that I've worked on, are some really nice pipe pipe racks with conduit, with their nice bends and and how nice that can all look, as well as like piping, piping racks can look really cool. And uh, even on some commercial buildings where they expose the ceiling, and having that in, uh, I don't. I don't think uh, the armored cable looks very good exposed. But I do think our EMT conduit looks really good exposed uh, using the right application. I think it's pretty cool looking. All right, let's switch gears to the electrical service, and you can see something where. You have the above ground service coming in and then dropping into the meter. Uh, have that service drop there. Or you could be experience it going underground to the meter. So two different uh, common ways to get power to a residence or maybe a, a light commercial building. Let's look at the... The meter a little closer not not the actual meter but the meter enclosure and so on this one we have the the overhead riser service entrance and then we have the meter socket box and so you bring in usually uh, um, rigid conduit down into this box and then you can kind of see all this rigid conduit all the way down to your the service panel which in this diagram they're showing it inside the house and, and that's kind of simple right you're just bringing conduit through this enclosure this is where the the meter might be but it's pretty common nowadays to see like meter plus uh plus some main uh main disconnecting switches or circuit breakers or over overcurrent protection might be might might be the most accurate way of saying it some overcurrent protection in that panel as well but uh there's lots of different ways to do this and i'm not saying one's better than the other but i would if i was doing it at home i would want some uh uh i definitely want more than just the meter on the side of my house i want some space to be able to put in some uh circuit breakers but uh notice that they've got we talked about this last time you got the the neutral and then two service wires right here and then the meter reading that then we're going to the panel let's uh let's go on to another version of it this is the one from below ground where uh the coming from the utility provider into this uh, meter box here then back down into the home uh, where there's the service panel. And, I mean, I don't know why this is. I just want to be able to show different different ways to do this. This is a just a good. Hey, it could be done this way. It could be done that way. Not that there's anything that, from a general contractor standpoint that uh, uh, I get a control. It's really just the utility provider that says it's going to be uh, below ground or above ground. I mean, is there a power pole there? Is that where the power is, and it's on a pole, or is it? Uh, coming through like a newer neighborhood and it's all buried underground. So is there a transformer up on a pole? Then it's probably going to be the other one. If it's a 
and, and even stuff on a on a power pole it can come down the power pole then go underground and sometimes that's a choice that the client can make um, anywho lots of different ways to do it now I was saying previously that this is single phase I love how they switch back like my slides go back and forth between 115 to uh, 120 like right here we're saying 230 rather than 240 but really the point is the 120 volt is uh, each on uh, the service wires and and two of the wires coming from the transformer uh, both are 120 or 115 whatever you want to call it right 120 volts and you add those up and now they're, they're 230 it's it's sort of a weird way of saying um, but if it was like 480 uh, 480 is a completely different voltage and I don't believe that like uh, it's not added up into 480 by smaller voltage every single wire on the in in the 483 phase I believe is 480 volts but for some reason on this one they they added up uh, the 120 and the 120 and then you have a two a 240 service and then you have two bus bars here that are different different legs of that and so uh, <clears throat> if you join one from each side of this bus then you have 240 or 230 or 220 whatever you want to call it geez I hate that there were, that one's uh, anyway kind of a cool little diagram here showing the grounding bar the neutral bus bar and notice that the the neutral bus bar in the panel is also connected to the ground water, ground rod um, so even though I don't know like the technical side of why the neutral is not considered a ground because you could also have a ground uh, terminals in here also being connected to the ground rod but basically at the meter everything the neutral and the ground is coming back to the ground rod do 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 let me look at my notes. Okay. Oh, that's kind of what we were just talking about. Where you combine one side of the bus and the other side of the bus, uh, or one bus and the other bus. So you have these two d different bus bars, and then you can combine those into. Um, this double pole breaker and then you have 240 volts or 230 volts or 220 volts whatever you want to call it above me why they call that why is it 230 versus 220 or 2, 2, uh, 240 whatever doesn't matter <clears throat> oh wait but we do have uh, overcurrent protecting device here single pole breakers so um, uh, you have the kind of a good diagram here where we have the neutral landing on on this neutral bus bar you see that kind of better separated here so you have these two buses coming down hot bus bars and the circuit breakers land on top of these and what the hot wire would go in and be connected to the circuit breaker here and that would be directly that hot wire is directly connected to this and then the neutral wire would come on and land on that and then somewhere in here you'd have another uh, bus bar for the ground and that that ground uh, bus would then all come back to here so kind of kind of look at it right here where we have that um, the hot wire is going to this circuit breaker the neutral wire is going to the neutral bus. It's not showing the ground in this in this graphic though. So this is a uh, in in doing like um, neighborhoods and residential or multifamily or stuff like that. The uh, utility provider uh, for the is going to come out and like kind of dictate and work with the work with you a little bit on how they're going to provide power to all the 
all the residences. And so that's the, the civil engineer that's dealing with uh, laying out all the utilities and the elevations and the streets and stuff like that needs to leave a, a path for uh, the the power and, and gas and uh, sewer and all that other stuff. But the uh, the electrical, at least in Utah, I don't know if it does it differently in other states, but I have to work with the utility provider and uh, have them provide some information on how they're going to get what do they want us to provide this transformer pad? They're going to probably provide the, they'll obviously provide the transformer. Are we doing the raceway underground? What most common in a, in a neighborhood is the general contractors responsible to put the, the raceway in up to and mount, uh, mount the, the meter, uh, enclosure, but not put the actual meter on. And so when you, when you pass all your rough inspection then uh, you can have the city send that over to the electrical service provide the electrical uh, utility and then they will go do usually pull this wire and terminate and connect it to the transformer and then make that all live for you That, but it's it's also possible reading through some of the notes here is that it could be that the electrical company the the Rocky Mountain Power is going to do the trenching themselves. It's possible. So it's just uh, or it's possible that they put in the raceway. It's possible anyway. There's all kinds of configurations. Most likely I've seen where uh, it's the general contractor providing. Um, from the main transformer over to uh, the where the meter is on the home. So the service panel. This is an interesting topic to my my point of view. Um, now, this is the last thing. Is I don't know that it has to be the last thing, but this is what uh, the inspector is going to be looking for as well as that every circuit breaker is labeled even if it's uh, spare or not and uh but the panel cover being on but this is a, a good indicator that uh hey the electrician's ready for something right but uh the one of the phases or or stages to being able to pay attention to what in my, for my opinion for where a, an electrician is is whether um, raceway is done so is are we doing emt is the emt done or uh, say we're not doing emt say we're doing like the armored cable is the armored cable pulled and landing inside the junction boxes for outlets and lights uh, or whatever else uh, we need and is the wire coming into this panel so that's like one meaning the wire is pulled and then we could say the wire is landed and terminated or terminated and landed i'm not sure exactly what the right word would be uh, you could use i think those synonymous with each other but the idea is that all the wiring inside the panel once it's pulled is actually landed on all the different terminals and it's completely uh all the wiring is all all landed or terminated and so when you're at that phase right there, that that's a significant milestone for whatever panel we're at as well. And so wire pulled being one, uh, terminated and landed being another, and then being to a point where they can put the covers on the, the cover and have it all labeled. That's that's ready for final inspection, basically. But I, I usually look at it from those perspectives and if if you have a bunch of wire hanging out in the in the panel that's not terminated then we can't make that that uh can't make that panel live we can't put power to it even though we might have on a commercial building we might have power to the main switch gear uh it's going to be locked out at that point in time and they can't bring you can't bring up 
these other panels until they're all landed and terminated and put the front cover on. Okay. Or I shouldn't say can't, but it's unsafe to do that. And it's a best practice to definitely do that. Uh, and it, and I would, I would think that's the right way to do it is to, to not, not put people in harm's way and, and try and get, uh, but also I don't want to be from a general contractor standpoint, thinking oh hey wires pulled i'm going into the rooms right say i'm walking through a light commercial building and i'm seeing say we're using the armored cable and the armored cables all run and it's sitting there in the junction boxes and and i can see that uh okay that's all pulled all right then we we're ready to cover we do our inspection we cover it okay that's a good deal now i'm looking at i'm walking through the rooms again room by room by room and i'm seeing okay hey all the outlets uh, the wiring is terminated on the outlets, and so we should be good. We're ready to go. Let, turn, put power to these outlets. Put power to the lights. Now you need to go back to the main, wherever these panels are, uh, whether it be a main electrical room or somewhere else, and start paying attention to what panels are actually landed and terminated and, and com completely made up, and, and be looking through those to see how much more work is is there for the electrician and I don't like it when uh, we're like asking the wrong type of question in in like subcontractor coordination meetings and saying are, are you done in the rooms they can be done in the room wiring and terminating on outlets and lights that that might be the wrong question are we terminated and landed in the panel as well as the is the is the panel feeding uh, that panel all ready to go how, how are we doing on, on our entire, uh, I don't know what the right word is in there. I lost it, but I'm trying to go from like main switch gear to the next panel to the next panel. Right. And, and all the different, uh, uh, basically through the one line diagram, how far on the one line diagram are we, are we done at? And so don't want to, don't want to judge too much from walking room by room. It is a good indicator on how far along they are, but don't forget to go into the look at the panel as well or the multiple panels. All right. Uh, let's talk transformers for a second. And in order to go to transformers as a component, sort of need to, and I'm not so sure that, that I know this really, really well, but all I know is that you put uh, wrapping a conductor into a coil, um, it, it changes the magnetic field. Um, and so, and I let, let's talk about it from a, from a solenoid perspective first, but maybe maybe look at it like this, right? So, if if you had this uh, series of wires looped and it, they weren't super tight together, you maybe compare that with another uh, conductor wrapped into this coil. It would be a stronger magnetic field in this mode versus that mode. And so when we look at it from, you can do mechanical work with that. And this is a solenoid. And so you could bring power to a solenoid, wrap that solenoid with a bunch of wi wires called the windings, put power to it, close the switch, right? And uh, and that magnet has this iron core and it could pull that iron core in and compress a spring. You open the switch, turning the power off to this coil and the spring can push that iron core out. So we're, this is literally how a solenoid works. And through this uh, making a coil out of wire and, and creating a magnetic field with it. Now, from a, a layman's point of view, from my perspective, I'm not great at this stuff, but I understand the basics that the using that same principle is how to do uh, to in a transformer is how to change the voltages. So you bring the voltage into the supply side of a transformer and 
the windings on the other side of the transformer, if they're different than the windings over here, then you're going to get a different uh, voltage coming out the secondary out of that secondary coil. And so the the power coming into this is going to create an electric uh, a magnetic uh, field, and that magnetic field will transfer electricity into here. And then, but the winding. So take a look at this side right here, right? So if we had a different set of windings here, and notice that that's uh, spaced out, and then this is more closely spaced. So you're you're bringing in less voltage and you're transferring to a higher voltage here you step up the voltage and if the case was here you're saying like this is the supply side here and or the primary coil here and less windings fewer windings on this side then you're getting uh, a lower voltage coming out of this side of the transformer out of the secondary coil hopefully that makes sense so just using magnetic uh, magnetic flux to adjust the voltages and uh, and I, I don't know that it's uh, super important for general contractor to know that from my perspective like I don't know that I've ever really used that knowledge in scheduling or writing a contract I'm never gonna write a contract saying uh, make sure that your windings are correct and your <laughs> I wouldn't do that but I think it's important to know the concept that uh, it's dealing with windings and uh, notice notice that uh, you have two wires coming out of here. Anyway, I thought that uh, I thought that there's usually like a third to for some reason. Hmm. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, the let me look at my notes. Okay, so I hope that that was a. Uh, was good on going through all the not all of them but some basic electrical components going from switches to outlets to wiring to more detail on raceways and different kinds of wire both the uh, uh, non-metallic shielded like Romex to BX to um, MC cable and then all the way to uh, EMT rigid and then spending some time on the service as well as a transformer and uh, Hopefully that was good and we'll uh, catch you in the next class